Hello, I'm Andy Humphrey with Heavenbound Aviation in Johnstown, Ohio. And this morning we're out doing some flying in a 2019 Quicksilver Sprint. This model has the Hearth F23 engine on it. This morning we're going to explain a little bit about it, do a walk around, show you the different aspects of it, uh, and hopefully give you a better understanding of what Quicksilver flying is all about. This Quicksilver Sprint was built here at Heaven Mound Aviation with the F-23 engine. Uh, we pioneered the first installation of the F-23 on a Quicksilver. Uh, you can see more about that on YouTube and our website if you wanted to look into that. Uh, as far as I know, we have either built or been involved in the building of every one so far as of the making of this video. Uh, it is an outstanding combination. Uh, we've actually been able to improve it a little bit since the first one, but the first one was sold to a local customer. Uh, who we stay in touch with regularly. Uh, he's got about, 2000, about 200 hours on it now. Uh, we sold that to him in 2015 after Sun and Fun, after we debuted it there. Uh, and he's loving it. The one thing that he would have changed is to add electric start, and we're getting ready to do that. Otherwise, uh, he loves it as is and has no regrets about that at all. We're going to talk a little bit about this one and some of the changes that we've made on this from the first one. Some of the options that we have added to this one uh, from the base kit, obviously we've added the F23 installation. We've also added Black Max brakes, you know, not something you have to have, but I really like them and encourage them. We've added the steerable nose wheel, and I would really recommend that uh, for the main reason being that we need some weight up in the front anyway, and I'll show you here in a minute that we've actually mounted more weight to the steerable nose wheel, but just the additional weight of the steerable nose wheel is a help. So. Uh, you might as well go ahead and throw that on there. Uh, we're also using the Ultra Prop, the Generation 2. It's a 66 inch. We'll talk about that as well. And we've added the MGL engine monitor to it, uh, which I do like, uh, but I would encourage you to have a digital engine monitor of some sort. Uh, it's really a good way to go on these. So we'll walk around and talk about the various options on this aircraft. Uh, the base kit, uh, you can build this aircraft with this engine uh, with these options from a kit, you're going to have maybe about 20,500, 21,000 right in there somewhere. Uh, this aircraft, fully built uh, as it is here, turnkey for the customer, was a little over 24. Now, the big part of that cost, unfortunately, is the engine. The F-23 currently with the belt drive is $7,500. Uh, that's with the electric start. That's a huge part of the cost. There's nothing we can do about that. I wish it wasn't so expensive, but it's really the best choice for this airframe. Uh, at Heavenbound, we're happy to sell you this as a kit and provide support. If you want to build it, it's extremely easy to build. Uh, the manual is pretty good. It could use a few updates here and there. Uh, all the parts come, you know, plastic wrapped on cardboard with part numbers. Uh, it's, it's very easy to assemble. Uh, you're really not uh, drilling a lot of holes and fabricating stuff. You're just following the assembly. It's kind of like an erector set, really. So. Uh, I really encourage people to build it themselves. It's, it's actually a lot of fun and not difficult. 
If you want heaven bound to build it, uh, at this point we're building them for three thousand dollars, just flat rate. So, uh, you know, take your kit cost, add three thousand, and you got a turnkey aircraft if that's the way you want to go. If you're not familiar with ultralights in general, a lot of people watching this video may know nothing about the ultralight world. So let me talk about Part 103 of the Federal Aircraft Regulations. Part 103 is what covers ultralights. Basically, an ultralight is 254 pounds or under. That's, that's your maximum empty weight of the aircraft. No fuel, no pilot, or anything like that, of course. The empty weight. Um, there's no horsepower limitation. You do have a five-gallon fuel capacity, though. That's their max for fuel capacity. And we can't have a speed of higher than 60 mile an hour, full power, straight and level. Uh, and the stall speed has to be 25 or under. So uh, this aircraft meets all that criteria. Uh, I think you'll find it's probably the best ultralight kit out there right now, at least in my opinion. Uh, if you want to go somewhere, if you want some speed, this is not your aircraft. Uh, we're cruising, you know, typically 30, 35 mile an hour is kind of the sweet spot of where this aircraft likes to be. Uh, the stall speed is 16, so it will really slow down. And it has an extremely gentle stall. I mean, you really can't do anything with a stall. It just ends up in a high sink rate. So uh, it's pretty hard to get hurt in a Quicksilver. People have done it, but it's pretty difficult. Quicksilver has built 15,000 aircraft in the last 40 years. There's no other aircraft manufacturer that even comes close. They built more aircraft than Cessna, Piper, and Beechcraft combined in the same time period. So they're a proven design. There was a lot of engineering that went into these in the early days, a lot of testing. Uh, they really tested, cycle tested all the different things, load tested, fatigue tested. These are a very well tested aircraft. The 2S model now that we train in is a special light sport, so uh, it meets all that criteria. Essentially a almost certified aircraft is the way special light sport is written. So. Uh, Quicksilver is a fantastic company. There's no other company out there that comes close in volume and in safety and in flight hours and operation. So, highly encourage them. This is the Hearth F23 engine. If you're not familiar with it, this engine is a 50 horse engine. Uh, the Hearth is made in Germany. They've been making this engine for around 20 years now. It's gone through a few design changes over the years, but essentially it's the same engine. This engine also is used to power a lot of UAVs around the world, and that's really its primary role in life. We're kind of a, a side business for them, really. Uh, but this is currently my favorite two-stroke engine, hands down. It's really the best engine we have available for Part 103 right now. We may have some other options, you know, coming that are, you know, really proving themselves now, perhaps, but. For right now, this is the go-to engine if you want to stay part 103. This engine, as it's sitting here, has electric start. It weighs about 78 or 79 pounds, all up with electric start, exhaust, the redrive, everything. So that's about 10 or 12 pounds lighter than a 447. And we've gained 10 horsepower on the 447. So really a wonderful engine. Uh, what we have, dual ignition, uh, which is something the 447 never had. It uh, gives you some added reliability. Uh, this also has Nicosil cylinders, which will wear a lot longer than the steel sleeve engines of the Rotax line. Uh, so we really like that. The way the electric start is designed, the starter is tucked right up in here. So there's very little weight. It's out of the way. It's not something bulky that's added on like in the Rotax application. Uh, this engine was designed for electric start from the beginning. It's not an afterthought. So we really like that. It really adds to the safety. Uh, you can save a few pounds by putting a recoil start on this engine, but I don't recommend it. We did that on the first one, and recoil start's just not worth it. It's, a, it's really a pain. Some of the modifications that we've had to make to put this engine in this airframe, uh, we have actually mounted this engine inverted. Uh, this would normally be the top of the engine. We've put it on the bottom, but the carburetors won't work on the bottom. So to solve that, we actually remove the cylinders and heads, pistons, and we flip them over 180 degrees and put them back on, move the carburetors back up to the top, and now we've got it configured the way we want it. Uh, it works perfectly that way. Uh, the engine doesn't care one way or the other. So uh, the ignition, which was down here, we've actually moved up here now. So we took the original, this is the original plate that the ignition is mounted on. We've created a plate for the front of the engine and just mounted it right there where it's out of the way. So that worked out really well. 
This engine is carbureted. Uh, the F23 did have fuel injection, and some of you may still see that out there online. It's no longer available, and if it was, I wouldn't recommend it anyway. It's around $3,000, and it just doesn't really give you anything. It does run maybe slightly smoother, but you're giving up reliability for it. You have a whole lot of single point failure items in that system that you know will just shut the engine down if they quit. The carburetors are really reliable. They're pretty bulletproof. Uh, once you get them tuned right, very little maintenance if you run good gas, take care of your fuel lines. That's really about all there is to it. As far as maintenance on this engine, uh, the spark plugs, every 100 hours, I wouldn't touch them for 100 hours. Uh, when you do replace those, make sure that you have the threads dry. Torque them to 109 inch pounds, no more, no less. Got to be exact. No Chinese torque wrenches, torque it right. This is an aircraft. If you over torque these or you put them in with oil, what you're going to find is the threads are going to weaken. And at some point, when you get a high enough CHT, one of them's going to pop out, and now you don't have any power. You're going down. So just take care of these. They won't give you any problem, but if you treat it like a lawnmower, it's going to be reliable like a lawnmower. So this is an aircraft. Respect it. This exhaust is configured specifically for this application as well. You can see, we'll show you another shot here in a minute. We have this mount where these mufflers are mounted right to the engine, so they move with the engine as it flexes. Uh, it's a very solid mount. We just don't have any exhaust problems with this application, so we really like that. Um, the engine mount, we'll try to get a, a better shot of it, but what we've done in this installation compared to the previous models uh, of Quicksilvers, we've moved this engine all the way to the back of the root tube. We even trimmed the root tube off a little bit, trying to keep it as forward as we can for center of gravity. Uh, but in doing that, we've eliminated 17 pounds of shaft drive system. So we've saved a ton of weight with this application. And you'll see how we've built the mount. It's pretty similar, really, to other uh, mounts that we've done in the past. We've got two angle irons sandwiched on there, and then we've got an engine plate that bolts to that with berry mounts. So uh, really nothing terribly unique about that. Uh, the way we've set this up, we've mounted the fuel pump right here with fuel line standoffs. Very important to keep this weep hole down uh, on this elbow on the bottom of the fuel pump. A lot of people don't realize there's a weep hole there. If you mount that vertical or up, you know, you're not going to be able to weep the fuel out of here. If it accumulates any fuel in there, it'll hydrolock and you'll lose your fuel pressure. Now, if you're looking at this engine with the custom configuration that we have here and you're concerned about your skill level of, of converting it, don't worry. This is not something this that the customer does. does. We actually order this so engine completely configured this way. Uh, the this exhaust is on it, the V-drive is on it, the but cylinders make sure are split, that you do all a you have to do is literally this bolt it on the airframe. You fly, so you're this is the need simplest airplane weight. to build that there is. One thing I really want to highlight about this aircraft, with this engine in particular, is that because we've moved that engine all the way to the back of the root tube, we have moved our CG aft. And most likely, depending on your weight and dimensions, you're probably going to need some weight on the front end. Now, I'm right at 195. so. The CG works out with me that we need nose weight, uh, and I've got the seat in the middle position currently. And what you'll see here is the weight rack that we came up with. Uh, we've got a C channel, just a regular three inch C channel in the middle, and we've got exhaust clamps that are bolting that to the steerable nose wheel. And then we've made some half inch steel plate, half inch by four. Each one of these plates is five pounds. So I've got right at 20 pounds of weight on here, and that comes out about where I need it. Uh, remember, ballast does not factor into part 103, so we're not hurting ourselves there at all. Uh, there's an exemption for that. But make sure that you do a weight and balance on this aircraft before you fly it, because you're probably going to need some nose weight. Here we've got our battery box. This battery box is actually sourced right from Quicksilver. Uh, works really well. We've mounted it just on some aluminum angle. Uh, I found that's a good way to do that. Uh, just rivet it right to the root tube and then we bolt it to the battery box. It's a good solid mount, not going anywhere. We mount our voltage regulator to the battery box. On the back side, we have the starter solenoid. So pretty much our whole electrical system's right here. Uh, it keeps the cable runs short, uh, keeps save some weight there. Uh, inside here, we're using an EarthX ETX18B battery. Uh, just to be straight up, this is not what EarthX recommends for aircraft. This is more of a power sport battery. Uh, but we found it to work really well with this engine. Uh, it's plenty of power to turn it over. It's been reliable. 
Uh, it's a little bit lighter and a little bit less expensive than the ones they recommend for aircraft. Uh, if you want to upgrade, you certainly could. You're going to add about a pound maybe for their, their better battery uh, and about a hundred bucks or so. So it, it does add up in cost. Um, it just makes for a nice clean electrical system. We've just tied our wires together. We routed them through Adele clamps, keep them out of trouble. You know, nothing really moves around here. Fuel lines are, are on here with fuel line standoffs is what we call them. We use a piece of fuel line and a wire tie to give it a little bit of a buffer there and kind of isolate everything. If you're using those on fuel lines, don't over tighten them. You can restrict the fuel line, so be gentle with them. I like to use these spring fuel clamps. We'll show you a close up of those as well. They're inexpensive and they're very reliable. They, as the hose you know, expands and contracts with temperature, they'll adjust with it so they never loosen. They stay perfectly round. Uh, we like those real well. The, the normal, you know, marine type fuel line that's quarter inch, uh, the black ones work well with those. And along with the fuel system, you'll see up here, we have this crossover that connects the two sides of the tank, very important. There's a little bit of a loop in it to keep it from having a you know sharp bend there, so it's got some flexibility. One thing that we do a lot of times on these two is add a sump drain right here. You'll see that the fuel pickup is a little bit higher than where these are, so water is gonna collect in here, and really the only way to get it out without a sump drain is to take these off and make a mess, so. If you mount a little sump drain here somewhere and take your cup and sump it out, you don't have to worry about water. If you're running ethanol gas, you're not going to have water in it anyway. It's going to absorb into fuel. But we don't run ethanol gas. We don't recommend ethanol gas. It's garbage. Uh, run rec fuel. If you have to, you can run some av gas once in a while, but uh, don't feed it a steady diet of av gas. It won't like the lead. Uh, any kind of non-ethanol fuel is ideal. You can go to puregas.org and find out where to buy that locally. We buy it in bulk. It is a little bit more money, but it's well worth it. We're running a Blue Max uh, oil mix in this. We're running 90 to 1. We run that in all our engines. Uh, it works very well. You know, we've run uh, the 3203 I had on the Challenger. I had 600 hours on that when I sold it. No issues at all with 90 to 1 since day one. So that's what we recommend. Uh, that's what Hearth recommends. If you don't feel warm and fuzzy about that and you run, run 80 to 1, you can. It's not really going to hurt anything. Up here we have an MGL engine monitor, and we'll show that to you. That's the E3. It's the, the new color version, and it works pretty well. Uh, it's nice and compact, very lightweight. I like it for that reason. Uh, from a reliability and company support standpoint, I really like the Grand Rapids better. You may want to consider Grand Rapids. Uh, either works fine, but I do like digital engine monitors because you don't have to stare at them. You know, you got all your gauges in one unit and it has a light that flashes if anything's going wrong so you don't have to keep your eyes glued to the gauges all the time. You can always look and see what's going on but it's going to let you know if something's happening that's a problem. One of the options that we've added to this model here is the Black Max brakes. Black Max are hydraulic brakes. They're a very effective system. They're very lightweight, very low maintenance. It's the same system that we have on the 2S, and we're flying it at 1,000 pounds gross. And we've had it on there for uh, over 600 hours now, and I've calculated roughly probably around 3,500 landings, mostly student landings. And we've had no maintenance on the brakes. They're fantastic. So I really recommend these. Can't say enough good things about them. Uh, they are about a $500 upgrade, so keep that in mind. But, you know, it is worth it. If you're buying a new airplane, I would put them on there. We've mounted the master cylinder right here. It doesn't work well on the stick on this airplane because of the shape of the stick. Uh, it works really well right here, though. It's easy to grab. It's, uh, it's effective. And the Black Macs come with these polished wheels, which are really nice. There's a and misconception out there tires, that ultralights are dangerous. Uh, these tires are I nice and soft people, if you ultralights run right are not dangerous. Dangerous. Ultralight pilots uh, are dangerous. We're running about 10, 12 pounds There's a these. misconception uh, they work that really well. it gives ultralights you a nice are a toy landing, much better than the original because training is not required, that you don't need training. Uh, so All I would recommend the Black Max this upgrade. This aircraft is very well engineered and in capable hands, it's extremely safe. 
One of the questions we get asked a lot about this setup is what prop The lower the stall speed, the less severe the injuries of the accident are. This aircraft has a 16 mile an hour stall speed. It's arguably one of the safest aircraft in the world to fly. When we talk about safety of these airplanes, a lot of people think they're unsafe. Uh, and I would definitely argue that. My 16 year old daughter flies these airplanes uh, and I encourage that. For a lot of parents of teenagers here, Dad, can I borrow the car, which would strike fear in my heart. My daughter says, Dad, can I borrow the airplane? And I don't mind that at all. Not only do the flight characteristics make this airplane very safe, very simple to fly, but from a mechanical standpoint, everything is out in the open and available for inspection. There are no inspection covers on this airplane. You don't remove covers to inspect anything. It's all out in the open. There's really no difference in a pre-flight inspection and an annual inspection. And in the air, we're seeing about 6350 to 64 on climb out. Now, if you're an astute studier and you look Part at 103 the does not have any say, pilot hey, training requirements. You don't have to take right. any yeah. lessons to fly this but aircraft. That that's the but don't works. misinterpret the that for that. The saying that training is not needed. That's not what we're saying at all. If you fly this without training, you will almost certainly get hurt. Don't try that. Training is available, make good use of it. If you have no aviation experience at all, if you can budget $2,000 for training, typically that will get you safe to solo an ultralight. Don't skip that step. If you can't afford that, find a different hobby. We're still only cruising at, you know, 48 to 5,000, so we got plenty of cruise reserve. Very impressive climb performance, uh, and it's a great setup. The first one of these that we built, we built several now. It's running the 6630 Tennessee, which gives us about the same RPM, you know, right around the 6400 climb out. Uh, it's coming up on 200 hours in operation now. It's doing a fantastic job, so uh, no reason at all to worry about it. Uh, but we really like this combination. So uh, we also included the spinner with the Ultra Prop. That's from Ultra Prop. Uh, the only thing we did was paint it with Stewart Systems Eco Acrylic to make it look a little nicer. Uh, we're running the 2.5 reduction with the engine. Uh, that comes from Hearth as well. It's a multi-V groove. Uh, it does a fantastic job if it's adjusted properly. You'll never have any slip. And it does allow a little bit of a give at an idle because the F23 fires both cylinders at the same time. So at idle, there's a lot of torsional vibration there. And if you don't have a little bit of slip, it's going to eat the transmission up. And the gearbox will not work on an F23 in case you wanted to try that. Uh, don't bother. It has to have this belt drive. And you're also saving considerable amount of weight on this belt drive. It's 11 pounds compared to 19 with the gearbox. Another option that we've added to this Quicksilver is the Stewart Systems UV clear coat. Now the reason that we've done that, uh, one is to protect it from ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light has two negative factors on the fabric. First of all, it's going to fade the fabric, so you're going to lose that color intensity as it ages out in the sun. But it also degrades the strength, so it's going to begin to tear easier and become unairworthy fairly quickly. If you parked a sailcloth uh, airplane out in the sun all summer, in one summer the fabric would not be airworthy anymore, so it deteriorates really quickly. By applying the clear coat, we've tremendously blocked that UV, so it's going to last a whole lot longer outside. Uh, you're going to keep that deep, vibrant color. Uh, you're going to have a, a glossier finish, which is also nice. But it's going to protect the fabric and keep it airworthy for many, many years. Uh, the fabric is fairly expensive to replace, so it's a good investment to clear coat it. Another side benefit to it, though, other than the appearance, uh, is kind of nice with the gloss. But it also makes it easier to clean. If you have bare sail cloth, any oil that comes off the engine and lands on the tail or, or bird dirt, various things like that, are going to stain that fabric. After a few years, it starts to look pretty ratty. With the clear coat, all that stuff just wipes off. Uh, this is a, actually based on a certified clear coat. Uh, this STC with Stewart Systems. And we've taken a, the clear version of it and added UV barriers into it that are visible. So uh, it's a great product. The flexibility of it will last for years and years. Uh, it won't peel and crack like a lot of the solvent-based ones do. And as with all Stewart Systems products, this is a waterborne product, so it's non-hazardous. You can spray it at home and, and not have to, you know, wear tons of protective gear, uh, just a respirator. As far as cost, if you'd like to do it yourself, right now the materials are running about $350 a gallon. And it takes between a gallon and a gallon and a half to coat the whole aircraft, depending on, you know, how much you want to apply and what result you're looking for. Uh, you can apply it where the weave is, is still present and you can still feel the weave. 
it's kind of soaked down into the weave, or you can go all the way till it's filled the weave and actually a, a smooth gloss finish. Uh, it's more of a user preference. Um, it's well protected either way. A lot of people wonder about the weight. Uh, we did some weight studies on this, and the whole airplane coated in clear coat will add about four pounds, three to four, depending on how heavy you apply it. So it's not a huge factor unless you're really close to 103 and, and absolutely have to meet it. Um, but it's well worth the investment to, to protect these sails. Not only are they fairly expensive, uh, around $2,000 right now, but they're also getting really hard to get. There's fewer people that make them, so it's definitely worth protecting them. We'd highly recommend it. Another question that frequently comes up when talking about Quicksilvers compared to other makes of aircraft is the cable bracing versus strut bracing. Quicksilver in most of their models does use cable bracing and some people see that as a negative but there's really nothing negative about it. As far as strength, these cables are between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds tensile strength per cable depending on the size. There's two different sizes used uh, and you can see there's uh, four per side. Uh, so that's a whole lot of tensile strength there. You're never going to pull these apart. They're extremely strong. Uh, some people don't like the look of them. I guess that's a personal preference. One other thing to consider is on top, we do have a king post, and that is about 9 feet 6 inches tall. So keep that in mind if you're looking at a hanger. Uh, you're going to need a door at least that tall. But otherwise, there's really no drawbacks to wires compared to struts. <laughs> There's a misconception out there that ultralights are dangerous, and I always tell people ultralights are not dangerous, ultralight pilots are dangerous. There's a misconception that ultralights are a toy, or it, because training is not required that you don't need training. All those are misconceptions. This aircraft is very well engineered, and in capable hands, it's extremely safe. The lower the stall speed, the less severe the injuries of the accident are. This aircraft has a 16 mile an hour stall speed. It's arguably one of the safest aircraft in the world to fly. When we talk about safety of these airplanes, uh, a lot of people think they're unsafe. Uh, and I would definitely argue that. My 16 year old daughter flies these airplanes uh, and I encourage that. For a lot of parents of teenagers here, Dad, can I borrow the car? Which would strike fear in my heart. My daughter says, Dad, can I borrow the airplane? And I don't mind that at all. Not only do the flight characteristics make this airplane very safe, very simple to fly, but from a mechanical standpoint, everything is out in the open and available for inspection. There are no inspection covers on this airplane. You don't remove covers to inspect anything. It's all out in the open. There's really no difference in a pre-flight inspection and an annual inspection. Part 103 does not have any pilot training requirements. You don't have to take any lessons to fly this aircraft. But don't misinterpret that for the saying that training is not needed. That's not what we're saying at all. If you fly this without training, you will almost certainly get hurt. Don't try that. Training is available. Make good use of it. If you have no aviation experience at all, if you can budget $2,000 for training, typically that will get you safe to solo an ultralight. Don't skip that step. If you can't afford that, find a different hobby. If you're not familiar with Heavenbound Aviation, uh, we started back in 2006 doing ultralight flight training. And as the light sport rule came out and changed the industry, we've changed with it. Uh, we focus on ultralights and light sport aircraft. Uh, we're a Quicksilver dealer. Uh, we sell new Quicksilvers, we build Quicksilvers, we train in Quicksilvers. Uh, we love Quicksilvers, but we do other stuff as well. Anything light sport uh, we'll help you out with. We can do training. Uh, we can do maintenance. Uh, I'm a CFI and AMPIA, so whether it's experimental or certified or whatever you're into, we can help you out if it's in the light sport world.